Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Roundup. Bienvenue à tout le monde. My name is Luca Patuelli. I am also known as Lazy Legs. I am a professional dancer, motivational entertainer, and dance educator. I am also a co-chair of the Disability Without Poverty movement. Today, we are welcoming you to Roundup, a monthly event that we host to bring together artists, athletes, and activists together to share their passion with our community in hopes to be able to bring together as many people together as just to be able to celebrate life and just to be able to come together as a movement. Before we begin, I want to just acknowledge that I am calling in from Boucherville, Quebec, the south shore of Montreal on the Kanawakwe Mohawk territories. And before we introduce our guests today, we have a couple house uh, keeping rules and, and just the language options. So I'm gonna actually be reading a little bit of a script uh, to get you all uh, making sure that as everything's accessible. And I'm going to share my screen to go into a PowerPoint presentation at this moment. Um, as mentioned, this Roundup event is brought to you by Disability Without Poverty. We are a grassroots cross-disability-led coalition that brings together as many people, collaboration, ah, excuse me, I forgot to drink my coffee this morning. We are a grassroots cross-disability-led collaboration to end disability poverty. We are really hoping to be able to help uh, as many people as possible. And um, our, our presentations are uh, being interpreted. So it's just important for everybody to understand that you can choose two languages. We're going to be going over the accessibility components for the agenda today. First, please select your preferred language, English or French. You do this by selecting the interpretation option on your Zoom menu. Once you've selected this option, you will, need, you will not need to change the language settings again during the presentation. You must select a language even if you want to hear this presentation in English. If you are using a mobile device, such as a phone or a tablet, you can find language interpretation options under more. Alors, c'est très important que vous choisissez votre langue. So it's very important for you to choose a language. Even if you understand English, you need to click on English. The presentation for everyone to be aware will be made in English because all our guests are English speaking guests. However, uh, I'm doing this part in French and in English so that everyone understands. Language. For those who require ASL or LSQ interpretation, we will be spotlighting those components throughout the presentation. We recommend using Zoom speaker view to view the interpreters and current presenters. If you are using shortcuts, you can press Alt F1 on your computer to switch between these views. If you are using a Mac, you can use this by pressing Command Shift W. Alors c'est très important si vous utilisez le uh, ASL ou le LSQ. So if you're using ASL and LSQ, we will do a pos uh, spotlight on the presentations on the um, interpreters if you would like to make some changes in your spotlight you can press on alt f1 on your computer to switch between these views or if you're using a mac or an apple computer you can do this by pressing command uh, shift and w you want to select the captions options on your computer on your zoom menu if you would like to adjust the size and the placement of these captions, you will need to go into your Zoom accessibility settings. Alors pour les sous-titres, il y a un bouton, ça dit transcription en direct. Uh, so, to enable captions, select the captions option on your Zoom menu, and you can even adjust the size and placement of these captions. 
This presentation will feature pieces from individual, um, <clears throat> excuse me. This presentation will feature pieces from individuals with disabilities from across Canada. We would wanna hear your feedback, but we are gonna be making, muting everyone um, because we can't hear from everyone individually. Therefore, we ask you that you use nonverbal reactions to show your appreciation for our presenters. This includes using reactions buttons on your Zoom menu, comments in the chat box, and hand waving. If you have a camera turned on, for those participants who have their cameras on and want the opportunity to be spotlighted, you can also wave to the camera from time to time, and it could happen where um, the host might choose to spotlight you just to say hi. Please note that out of respect to our artists and our guests, we are, and those who use screen, that, <clears throat> please note that out of respect to our artists and those who use screen readers, we will be turning off the chat box during each performance. We want our artists and our guests to focus and for everyone to be able to enjoy the performances and presentations uninterrupted. So to summarize our accessibility options, select your language, use the interpretation option, select speaker view, enable captions if required, and finally, make sure to give us your thoughts in the chat box or on the screen. Our team members are on hand to help you with any technical difficulties you may be experiencing. Alors, c'est très important à vous rappeler à... So, it's very important to choose your language of choice and to ensure that you can see the uh, recommended view and that you look at all the other options. There are people on our team who are here to help you. So if you have any technical difficulties, don't hesitate to contact someone from our team in the chat box. And please inform everyone that during the performances, the chat will be closed in order to respect people but in between the presentations, you do have the possibility of putting comments in the chat. Um, something else I really want to make sure is that, again, these events are brought to you by Disability Without Poverty. Um, we are a national movement. These events are to try to bring together as many people as possible to be able to, in hopes, whichever government wins this election, to work side by side with these governments for them to understand the importance of making Canada more accessible through a Canada disability benefit and making sure that Canadians with disabilities have a voice and a seat at the table to make sure that any laws or policy changes that involve people with disabilities, that people with disabilities are part of that process. You can have your voice heard. Um, we've as Disability Without Poverty, we've created a uh, really cool questionnaire which is going to help compile more information to be able to really make sure that this Canada Disability Benefit can be designed for people with disabilities by people with disabilities. In the chat box, the links will be shared. We are asking for everyone to please Take advantage and take a look at these um, this survey. Please pass it along to your friends, and let's make sure that Canadians with disabilities have a voice and a seat at the table moving forward. Whenever there's any changes um, and policies being built, for more information on following, oh, this is the last slide. Cool. Pardon for that. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Um, we're going to be introducing the next guest, but I'm going to be going off script real quick. Um, and I just want to sh quickly share the importance of why I am part of the disability without movement, uh, disability without poverty movement. I, um, I think that it's important as a Canadian with a disability that we come together as a community. Um, I think it's important that as many people as possible work together to try to make a change. Because if within our own community we're disagreeing and we're not working together, no politician is going to take us seriously. So it's our moment right now in less than 13 days 
There's going to be an election. This is our moment to make our voices heard. Um, so I encourage everyone to go out and vote. Make sure that we can share our concerns with what's going on for people with disabilities across Canada. And let's come together as a community. You know, I'm not going to lie. I don't understand half of the politics. I don't understand much of what's going on. But what I can tell you is that if we come together as a community, we'll be 10 times stronger and the changes will be made and there can be an impact for the future of Canada and for Canadians with disabilities across Canada. And maybe we can be a stepping stone and an example for the rest of the world to follow. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, I felt that's really important. And um, I think I'm very, very, very excited. Now, <clears throat> all right, let me just shake off the seriousness and let me just go into uh, Luca Lazy Legs. That's who I am. And I'm going to go into my energy and pass that energy on to our next guest, who is an amazing athlete. She just came back from Tokyo from the Paralympic Games. We have the incredible Tara Yannis. What's up, Tara? How are you doing? Good. How are you, Luca? I'm good. Honestly, I'm feeling better now that I can actually be myself. <laughs> in all honesty, I get so stressed in the beginning with the intros and having to do all these rules and all this type of stuff. Then I'm more a vibe person. And I'm so excited to have this moment to share with, for you to share with us your passion. Um, and I know that you just got back from Tokyo. So how are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling good. I mean, I think the jet lag is still there. Uh, so my days are, um, you know, I'm trying to get enough sleep and get to bed at the right time and um, not wake up too early. So I, I think with every day, you know, I'm kind of getting back into the groove, groove of being back home in BC. Nice. And, and that's where you're from? You're from BC? Uh, well, originally I'm from California. I grew up in California uh, and then I moved to North Vancouver uh, in late 2009, 2010, uh, became a citizen, Canadian citizen. Thank goodness. Uh, I love it here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've been here ever since. Amazing. Awesome. I'm, I'm actually a dual citizen as well. I grew up in Maryland and uh, I, I was born in Montreal, but raised in Maryland. Um, and I'm very, very thankful to be living in Canada and still be living in Canada right now. Um, so um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, what sport do you play and uh, what was it like being in Tokyo? Ooh, little about myself. Um, so I've, being an athlete for me has been in my blood since, I don't know, since I can remember, probably five years old. My mom threw me in all these different sports. I grew up with uh, a single mom and I think she just wanted to make sure that I stayed out of trouble. So she put me in everything she could possibly put me in. And I'm super thankful for that. Uh, I've always been really competitive and always wanted to, if I was going to be in sports, I wanted to be competing at the highest level. I didn't want to um, just sort of, uh, you know, be in this sort of middle ground. So anyway, I used to be a professional mountain biker. And uh, when I was able-bodied before I had an accident. So I was able to race around the world uh, and kind of live my dream of being a mountain biker for about 15 years. Uh, and then in 2007, I had a, a really bad crash and I crashed um, at a race in Colorado and broke my neck and broke my back. So I was super fortunate. My neck healed, but my back didn't. So it kind of from there, I had to, you know, it was one of those rediscovery sort of moments where I had to figure out who I was in life and what my identity was. And, you know, I was obviously having a bit of a crisis at that point and found Kara Sport. You know, it wasn't until years later after my accident that I was mentally ready to sort of figure out what I wanted to do. It took a lot of processes to get there. But anyway, I ended up starting with wheelchair tennis. And from there, uh, I met some players that had played on Team Canada national team for wheelchair basketball. And it was those players in BC that said, hey, you should really try basketball. So I did. And I think it was at that point I realized how much I missed team sport. 
Um, wheelchair tennis is a, is an individual sport and you travel on your own and you're just kind of on your own a lot and training by yourself pretty much. So with basketball, it was just sort of brought a whole team dynamic together. So it was awesome. Uh, and then, yeah, we qualified for Tokyo uh, in 2019 at the Para Pan Am Games in Lima and then went to Tokyo, just got back a two, three days ago. And it was quite the experience. So I'm just, yeah, it was my first Paralympic. So it was pretty unreal to experience that. Even in a COVID situation, it wasn't, wasn't quite the same as I think it would have been, but it was still an amazing experience. And were you, did you have to requalify for the team? Like, because like you would have gone last year if the Olympics didn't, uh, if the Paralympics didn't get uh, canceled? No, all the teams that were qualified were qualified. There was no re-qualifier for that or anything. And I, they really, there really couldn't have been anyway. I mean, everyone was already, I don't think there was any question about that, but I, I don't think that they, they could have held qualifiers anyway, because it was COVID. So, but yeah, every, every team was already, already in. And how did you maintain training during that, like year and a half pause? Oh, I went crazy. Um, you know, it's really tough to uh, to train for a team sport all by yourself. So for the first X amount of months, I don't even remember how many months I was just training in my backyard. So, um, you know, where I could I only have enough room for two or three pushes. So the coach here in BC that I've worked with, he used to coach the national team years ago. And so I was really lucky to have him as a mentor. Um, he's an amazing guy. And he, he had to relearn how to be a coach. He had to figure out how to coach me during a pandemic and in a team sport, but training just as an individual. So we did a lot of Zoom calls in the beginning. I was just doing drills sometimes without a ball, without a hoop. You know, and a lot of it ended up being very mental and I had to, um, it was a really good exercise for me actually to have to uh, visual, a lot of visualization, which I think in the past, I don't know how into that I was, but I was forced to be into it. Um, and then I was able to do some things at home that helped me work on my hand speed that I don't know that I would have got a chance to do had, I, had there not been a pandemic. I don't know that I ever would have focused on that. So there were some really good things that came out of it. But then, you know, once I could get back on court, I was training on court by myself. So there were some days that I was just, it's really tough to be able to know how your teammates, how you're going to work with your teammates again uh, when you're not on court with them and being able to know what they're going to do and what move they're going to make without saying anything. So, um, you know, it, it, it was tough, but I, you know, worked through it and it was ended up being fine in the end. I was going to actually ask you, it's a hypothetical question, but did you, do you feel that you are, you are physically more ready this year versus last year or physically and mentally more ready? Um, like now that you got to experience the Paralympics this, this year versus last year? Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think the hardest part about it was we had such momentum for our team. We had come together and had started to play really, really well as a team. I think it's difficult when you have 11 or 12 players that all have their own, you know, minds and their brains and whatever, and then really um, bond them, you know? And so we were on such a high winning the pair of Pan Ams, beating the U S um, that, you know, it was really tough. Um, so like individually, yeah, maybe I had some things that I was able to work on that were really great. Um, but also not being on court with anybody else. Um, and just little things like chair position and how to, you know, how to come in and do a seal and, um, you know, gauging your speed on court. There were a lot of different things. So yeah, some good things came out of it, but some things that ended up being more difficult for our team. And, and then, uh, you know, like in Europe, the restrictions were a little different. So teams were able to play each other. Whereas we, this last year, we didn't play anybody. We had no tournaments. We played, we scrimmaged each other. 
And then we scrimmaged the next generation men's team. So that was it. So we had no idea what our competition looked like. They had no idea what we looked like either. But, um, you know, there were some European teams that were able to get games against each other so they could at least feel each other out. Yeah, I can, um, just off topic, but as a dancer, because like a lot of dance competitions got canceled. And here in Canada, there's a lot of them are still canceled, but around the world or my friends in Europe and in Asia, the events have been going on. And for the past like six months, they've been competing. And so I feel like, I can't wait to get back onto like the competition circuit for that. So I can, I can understand that feeling of the scrimmages, like, you know, not being able to go around and, and kind of just feel out the, the competition out there live and everything. Um, yeah. Right now, what we're going to do, we're going to share a quick clip of your experience in Tokyo. We're going to mute it so we, we can continue the conversation. Um, but I wanted to, you know, you, you touched upon like team unity. Um, and I think that's the most important thing within team sports. And I, I can imagine that the challenges of being a year apart, coming back together and, and how you said individually, yeah, you might've been stronger, but we, we lack that, that, that unity that you guys had. Um, but from watching the clip, I don't know, I was really, really impressed. And so Tom, if you don't mind um, sharing this clip and I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more while we're watching the clip of like what goes on in your head and, and with the team, what you guys were thinking and, and, and what, during certain plays. Okay. So, this was the game against Japan. Was which uh, at what point were were you guys? Was this like your first game or your second game? Or? This was our second game. Our first game was against uh, the UK, and then this was so. This was our second game. Um, our first game, we came out nervous, but then in the second half, we started to play like we know how to play, and we won that game. Uh, so th these are our pool games. So yeah, this is the second game against Japan. Um, Japan's gotten a lot better. They've put a lot into their program. Um, but I think we just, we kind of have a little bit more depth in our team. Um, like we can go all the way down the bench and we have, you know, a lot of pretty much every player on our team can score and go out there and make an impact. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm just kind of like watching, this is the second time I've watched the clip. So uh, yeah, just right there, just kind of made a, a pass into Didi, um, who had backpicked someone. So she was wide open for a layup. Um, here, we're just playing a little bit of defense. Um, was able to come up with the steal right there. So I feel like you guys are showing my, my best moments. So this is great. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, that's Didi. There's a two on one. So she was able to get uh, another, another bucket there for us. And then we ended up, yeah, winning that game against Japan. So that was, it was great. You know, we, we should have honestly in our pool, our next game was against Germany and that game we lost by two points. Uh, we had an opportunity to win that game and it just, the, the baskets weren't going in and we had some bad luck with it. And that game really set us up for our quarterfinal game. So had we won against Germany, we would have played Spain in the quarterfinals. And it would have been a much easier game for us. Um, but instead, because we lost against Germany, we had to do a crossover. There's pool A and pool B. So when we did the crossover in the quarterfinal, we had to play the U.S., who they had won gold in Rio. And they are a really good team and very disciplined. And again, we had opportunities. But um, I think we kind of felt maybe a little bit of the pressure and knowing because once you get to the quarterfinals, it's do or die. If you lose that game, you're out. And so there's a lot of pressure, you know, you want to, you're, you're wearing the Canadian Jersey and you, you want to represent your country and you, you know, you want, there's so many things that you think about. You think about all the hours that you've now put in to training, you know, you think about all of the injuries just in so much. And so it's hard to mentally, set that aside, I think, for some players. 
and just play the game and just play free and play that you know how to play. Because when we play the way that we can play, we're pretty unbeatable. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the, um, in short, what happened in our tournament. Well, I think it's amazing. And I'm, I'm so happy that you and your team had the opportunity to come together and, and play and represent Canada. Because no matter the outcome, I think to us, you all won. And, and we're proud uh, of you and we're proud of the team. And does this mean that we're gonna be able to follow you all the way to Paris, 2024? Ooh, I mean, <laughs> I think so. Uh, in my gut, I would like to be there. You know, I really wanna experience a Paralympics uh, not in the middle of a pandemic. I think that would be amazing. Uh, you know, Tokyo, our, our arenas that we were playing in were sold out. So to know that we got there and there wasn't, there was no one in the stands, it was super uh, strange for us. So I would love to be able to experience that. So as long as the body holds up, then, you know, I, ha I still have my motivation. That's not wavering. So as long as the body holds up, I'll be there. That's awesome. And um, I just got two more quick questions for you. Um, I know that basketball and tennis are your sports but you're also going back into like adapt well you're very heavy into adaptive mountain biking um so would you mind just sharing a little bit more about that and and what it means to you to get back onto the bike after your accident yeah i mean pretty immediate after my accident i really wanted to get back out um on the mountain and and doing what I used to do. But at the time, you know, in 2007, there, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of equipment that could handle what I wanted to ride and what I wanted to do. So it took quite some time, but then I started a business and I basically, I import adaptive mountain bikes from a company in Poland. That's been, that they've been making adaptive mountain bikes for years. And the owner was a Paralympian. He, he raced Sitski. So he, it started by him building a bike for himself because he wanted to do it. And then people seeing it and, you know, we're like, Hey, where do you, how can I get one? So that's how it started. So I've had my business now, um, selling adaptive mountain bikes for years and, you know, work with adaptive organizations here in BC and, you know, working on working with different adaptive organizations across the country, but being here in BC and being able to have a face-to-face, -face, I think that's why I have that relationship here. So I work with like Whistler Adaptive and Kootenai Adaptive and working on getting them bikes and working on programming and camps um, just to kind of get the word out about bikes and, you know, to get people out on the mountain outside being active and having an outlet to do that. So it's uh, it's really grown. This sport has really grown. It was sort of when I first talked to Whistler Adaptive, I just sort of called them up. I I'd never met them before and explained what the bike looked like and took it up there and showed them the bike and, you know, had one of those moments where if like, if you build it, they will come sort of situations. And, you know, luckily they were on board and they bought a bike. And from then on, um, their equipment has been rented for, like every day in the summer. And so, you know, I, I kind of thought, you know, their sit ski lineup in order to get a sit ski in the winter, there's like a thousand person wait. People come from all over the world to be on sit skis at Whistler Adaptive. So I just, you know, it just seemed to make sense that if you have a program like that in the winter, let's get those same people out on the mountain in the summer. And it's, it's just taken off. So, uh, you know, I, I'm proud to say, I feel like BC is sort of the Mecca of mountain biking. Um, so it seems fitting that, you know, everything is really happening here in BC and they're really growing the sport. So it's, it's exciting. That's so amazing. And uh, if I'm ever in BC, I definitely want to come and check it out and, and, and uh, go on a mountain, uh, that, go mountain biking that like, I've never done it. So I would love yeah. to. Try it. Amazing. Um, so before I left, leave you off, I guess I have a question. Um, if there's something that, you Tara Yanis could do to I guess make a change within uh the way people see the the way society sees people with disabilities what what would you like to I guess 
what what impact would you like to leave off with? Oh, um, I mean, I guess it's kind of a tough one because everybody has their own, um, I guess, maybe thoughts around it. I do feel like being in Canada um, and, you know, probably North America, you know, they we do pretty good on, I feel anyway, in my view, um, on accessibility, we can always do better. Um, a thousand percent, you know, to me, it's like, every time I see a set of stairs, I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, like, why can't, you know, why, why don't we put a ramp in, you know, and that way everybody can use it. Yeah. It's things, things like that seem, um, so simple when it comes to, you know, building and, and, uh, creating. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, just people having an open mind. I think in the beginning, when I first got hurt, I would get really um, angry about that stuff. And I think over the years, uh, I've chilled out a bit, not to say that um, things can't be changed and worked on, you know, continuously. Um, but I think I find that when you approach it from a more constructive point of view, then, uh, than me just sort of being angry. Um, you know, you reach more people and they're more, um, they're more accessible, I guess you could say. So um, I don't know, I think just as a society uh, as a whole, you know, trying to take different points of view in and talking to people with different disabilities, just having a conversation, you know, about what works, what doesn't, you know, what's possible. I think that's where we kind of need to start. That's amazing. That's beautiful. I mean, we all learn off of each other. And I think that the only way we evolve is by discovering each other's strengths and together. So that's, uh, that's amazing, Tara. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us in this month's roundup. Um, I think, uh, are you going to be able to stay on or do you have to sign off? Uh, unfortunately, I had something come up that I need to kind of take care of, <laughs> especially being gone for a few weeks. And so I, a lot of things are kind of happening right now. But um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure to be on. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. Well, it's an honor to have you on. And uh, I know that for people that want, if they want to follow you, you have an Instagram account and you're on Twitter. Also, for more people that want to go and check out about Tara's business and adaptive uh, mountain biking, I highly suggest you check out her site. It's really, really cool. Uh, and if anyone's ever in the Whistler area or in DC, you know, we, I, I definitely want to go and check that out with you. So I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for representing our country the way you have. Uh, big congrats to you and your team and uh, looking forward to seeing you in Paris uh, in 2024. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Sarah. Cool. Thanks, Luca. Bye, everyone. So next up, I would like to invite a, a co-chair, and I've had the honor to get to know her a bit better in the past uh, four to five months, I think since March uh, this past year. Uh, Michelle Hewitt is uh, co-chairing the Disability Without Poverty movement with me. She's an activist, but she has a lot of many hidden talents, and I'm going to invite her to share a little bit more uh, uh, her story and her passion with us. So, uh, Michelle. Hey, Luca. How hey. you doing? Good. How are you? It's a little bit strange to be talking like this and not in a meeting about something. I know. I feel like I haven't seen you in like a couple hours. <laughs> 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 so Michelle, um, we call you the whip within our team. And uh, I, in all honesty, I think that you have a really beautiful way of getting people to get to the point <laughs> and just um, being organized. And But deep down, you are a mama bear. Um, and you have a sweetheart. And uh, I think I'd love for you to just let people know a little bit more about yourself and you have many hidden talents. And every time I get to talk to you, something new pops up. like, and you talk about like what you've done in your past. I'm like, Whoa, you've done that too. You've done that. Awesome. So I, I just want to leave you the floor to get our audience to know why you're so amazing. Well, I wouldn't say I'm that amazing. I think uh, there's many people out there who are a lot more amazing than I am. 
but um, I think, um, I guess, to go through a little bit of my history, um, I'm a classically trained musician. I did a degree in music with a second subject of mathematics, and I um, decided my path out of that wasn't going to be to be a performer. Um, I decided to be a teacher. And um, having been a, a high school teacher in England, I then had an amazing opportunity to move to Canada and to work at an incredible school called Lester B. Pearson United World College of the Pacific. It's an international school for 200 students um, in Victoria and with the students from over 80 countries, all uh, scholarship students, amazing, amazing kids doing their last two years of high school. And I taught music, I taught math, I was an administrator, I had this fancy title of Dean of Studies or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but I was like a principal, vice principal thing. I, um, there was a long tradition before I arrived at the college of the 100 voice choir. So half of the school sang in the choir and I conducted that and a number of things. And yeah, I was, um, I was a, I, as uh, you found out yesterday, I was a scuba diver instructor as well. And I, I taught on the diving program there for some time and was an all round active person. Then I decided, and, and the school is really built, and I guess this, this links into how you and I know each other. The school is really built on advocacy and activism. So in that time, you know, with the students, I did a lot of things that um, helping them to achieve the advocacy and activism that they wanted to do and, you know, could talk about that for a long time. But then after a while, and, and oh yeah, I was also a house parent to teen, 40 teenagers for nine months of the year. So mom and dad with my, my former husband, Ian, who passed away a few years ago. And uh, we had all these wonderful, wonderful students, 40th time living in our house with us. So I guess my heart then lent back to where it had always been, which was the public system. So at that point, I moved into the central Okanagan and I became a vice principal and then a principal in the school district here and was able to, you know, keep some of that activism going in some ways. And particularly the school where I was a principal was a very small school and was able to do a little bit of music and that sort of thing as well. But then pretty much 13 years ago, um, exactly, 1st of September, 2008, I got all of these weird feelings in my feet and my legs. And that was the Monday and it also happened to be Labor Day. And as a principal or any teacher can tell you that that day is pretty busy because you're getting ready for the next day of kids coming back to school. And my legs were moving myself and I was a lot lighter than I am now. And just things weren't working right. And by the first day I was in hospital with a aggressive version of MS that meant I pretty much didn't work, walk, work again. And within that, within uh, six months of then was a full-time wheelchair user, um, not work, not able to work with really severe fatigue. So that's, you know, one of my kind of biggest disabilities. So yeah, and that then put me into a completely different world as I began to realize just uh, how unequal um, our world is for disabled people and how I got a whole load of privilege and even with my privilege it wasn't wasn't a whole lot of good um, and so I started doing what I could to help others and to get involved and keep being you know that organized bossy bullying person that you know me to be to try and get people to listen and to pay attention to the things that needed changing. So and yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that was a perfect summary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I just in respect for time, because we have a very special guest uh, at the end. But I, I do uh -huh. have one more question before we actually share our video, and I, I want you to talk about our video and and your uh, talent. Um, but you know, you talked a lot about 
your inequalities and, and, and discovering from your transition of, of being an able-bodied person to uh, becoming disabled later on, like the inequalities that you've been facing, um, why do you feel it's important for you to be part of the disability without poverty movement and what do you hope to be able to achieve? Yep. So, um, one of the, you know, the biggest inequities that disabled people fight is poverty. Um, you know, I find that the values that are put on to disabled people that, you know, perhaps they should just try harder to work or things like that, when there are people who will never work and that just should not resign them to a life in poverty. Um, our society is big enough, has enough money and has great enough heart to make sure that all Canadians, whether they're disabled or not, can live a really decent life. So I just, I, I just feel it so strongly that, um, that we have a value system that is kind of out of whack with who disabled people are and, and what, they, what they need to get, to get through life. So I'm gonna, because you know, I am the whip and time is getting on and I do know about the guests. I'm gonna suggest that we just cut the little video out and I'm gonna talk, I'll, I'll just talk about one of the things that I lost when I first became disabled was music. I could not listen to something without my body shutting down and basically, basically becoming locked in. I couldn't. And so for somebody whose music had been a huge part of their life, no concerts, no radio, no CDs, nothing. Couldn't clap my hands along to nothing. Fortunately for my MS, I have an excellent neurologist who has really worked hard to get me some aggressive treatment. And I took the plunge to have it even more often than you're meant to. And with this in mind, I thought, well, let's see if I can still play my flute. So I decided to pick my flute up and I just want to explain, I can't hold it the way I used to. I'm going to try and play a short piece because I don't have the breath strength. I don't have the arm strength to hold it. My positioning, I'm going to have to rest my arm and that sort of thing. And who knows, this may all go to pieces because this is the first time I've done this for an extremely long time, but I kind of want to get this over and then we can move on to our guest. Is that okay with you, Luca? Honestly, Michelle, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited. I've got shivers because at the end of the day, like what I can tell you from my experience is that beauty comes out of vulnerability. And what you're about to do right now is that you're showing your vulnerability, you're stepping out of your comfort zone. And oh yeah, <laughs> and this that's how art is formed. And I just want to say that uh, we're thankful for you to be putting yourself out there and we're excited to listen to you. Um, okay, so. let's get this done and then we can move yeah. on. Okay, this is called Tambouran and it's by a French composer called Gosset. go that was awesome michelle um i have to be very honest with you the microphone was doing this so i bet <laughs> there was moments where you were like we could hear it it was beautiful i felt like i was walking in a forest and then there was other moments where i felt we were in traffic but <laughs> <laughs> that's probably right that's fine by me 
it was a moment, right? It was one of those moments. But so, you know, what you're gonna have to do next time is you're gonna have to record it on your iPhone and then we'll put the link in and then next time, uh, next time. Funny. <laughs> um, that was beautiful. And I just want to say thank you. Um, and I know that even though we had difficulty hearing it, I know that your heart was in it and we felt your passion. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I think I'll let you introduce the next guest because this person is someone that's very important to you. Uh, and before we get uh, him on, we'll share a video after you introduce the video. Sure. Let's go straight to that video. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. So, Tom, we can show the video of our next guest. There you go. Ends. Shadows of the evening. There are only so many seats at a briefing before, after, about the in-between. No one tells what's been through my eye, my brain, adjusting for the dark. Commendation. The commanders tell us we've done a good job. They are unofficially counting the dead Taliban on the hillside. I rest my paradigm, still smoking from the last shift. Rote learning. I pick up the bloody pieces of school children the dust of the explosion covers their faces. Eager girls in Calgary send their money, encourage more risk. Afghan teachers learn how to be alive. On my knees, my stomach empty, I know the drill is all I have. I bend to take the hand, chalk in its grasp, the letter incomplete. Out of place. Endless centuries of invasion. Nobody really sure who belongs here, but they all know it's not us. Poems from Afghanistan Confessions, published by Hagios Press in 2014, now available from Radiant Press. Written and read by Victor Enns. Hi there. Hi. So, Victor Enns, how do we know each other? Well, we've just been married a week and what? Five, six days? Six or seven days. Yeah. So I would like to introduce to everybody my husband, Canadian poet and writer, Victor Entz. So it was really important to you that we started this with some of your poems from your book called Afghanistan Confessions, um, published in 2014. Other than we know that Afghanistan is in the news, why was it important? The um, current news is something that uh, poets do often write about. These poems started back in 2007 after the Canadian forces had been there. Um, and uh, the connection to me has to do with uh, what's happened since. And that is the Taliban are back in power and their attitudes towards women is truly barbaric in my own opinion. There's a lot of people will say, well, that's their culture and so on. But when uh, I went there in 2008 and got a sense under a liberal regime, how things were done, the idea that they could be more conservative where women wouldn't be able to leave the house, wouldn't be able to make purchases without a male relative, even if it was a boy that was six years old, all of those kinds of uh, restraints my mother grew up in southern Manitoba, and this was in the 30s, 
and from her branch of uh, fundamental Mennonite Christians, uh, there was definitely the attitude that women didn't need to have an education. So that was sort of why I'd be paying more attention to Afghanistan, even, even back then, is to... to uh, you saw the parallels. I saw the parallels and wondered what it was going to be like, and here we are. I had no intention of going there with this particular interview until the, uh, until Kabul fell so quickly. I'd been in and out of that airport in 2008. I went to see for myself, but uh, it's really discouraging to see, and it's not going to get a whole lot, a whole lot better. I did grow up. In so yeah. So tell me then. Yeah, because you know I have to take control, don't I, Luca? <laughs> so tell me, when did you first think you were a writer then? Uh, it was uh, partly uh, realizing that there were things that I could do that other people couldn't. Uh, I had a variety of strikes against me. I was the principal's kid, the teacher's kid, the preacher's kid. And uh, uh, so bullying was something that I was familiar with. But reading and writing was something that I could do better than most people in my, in my small town. And what happened actually was I entered a call from a magazine called We Wisdom, and I published a story called Roger Clark at Indianapolis, because I was reading race car stories at the time, uh, and it was published. So uh, that was how things, uh, how things started. Um, and that's, so what was the feeling of being published then? Well, no one else in the whole school had been published in a magazine, right? So that was something that made me feel better about myself. I had, I guess, at least one invisible disability pretty early on in my life, and that was chronic depression. <clears throat> and writing, as it turned out, and reading have been ways out of, out of that, or having ways of dealing with that particular disability. It wasn't until the arthritis ended up causing me the loss of my uh, left leg below the knee that I started actually feeling that I was part of the disabled community because everybody could see it. And I still usually wear shorts so people can see that I've got a prosthetic. So let's go. A lot of your poems talk about times around your youth as you grew up in southern Manitoba. And so you're going to read a poem to us now called Raspberries. Okay. This was in my in my father's in my father's garden, which was about which was about an acre. We had a lot of raspberry bushes. Raspberries. Birds do little harm to raspberries buried in their bushes. Prefer strawberries splayed against the hot gray earth. We set out dishes of water to distract them. They are, after all, thirsty. Juice of red berries plucked from the vine, sweet as the sin of television. The raspberries, now they are mine. Every other day I claim the fruit, stick my bare arms into the rows of green and thorn, my head shaved and bowed, my red fingers in and out. Pray the season is over soon so I can retreat to the cool of the fall. In the meantime, red raspberries in my bowl, a wash in Jersey cream, a waltz on the radio. Thank you. And that Jersey cream came from? A Jersey cow. A Jersey cow that you had <laughs> as a family. Yes, yes. My brother was always upset that we moved to the city. The year it was my turn to start milking. <laughs> so I, I managed to avoid uh, that full-time chore. So you moved to the city in grade, in grade nine, and that's when you also had your first surgery. This was another contributing factor to my underlying conditions, as we call them now, depression. Essentially, the whole point of credibility of people believing that you're in pain runs through a lot of what I see in the disabled community, especially people that are dealing with things that aren't immediately visible. I was in pain in agony for three months before there was a correct diagnosis. I had a slip hip. It was a, an actual physical problem I had. I had to have my hip pinned. I was in traction. 
I had, uh, I was on crutches for three months and um, but had to rehab and all of that. But the fact that my parents, nor the doctor, could believe that my leg hurt as much as it did just created a whole new world in my head. Not necessarily a very good one. Until the, the day they believed you was the day that you, how did you get home from school? Oh, the day before. <laughs> the day before, actually, I had to uh, to crawl, actually, from the bus stop home. And I made a, a fuss about this at home. So uh, I was sending the doctor on the bus the next day. Uh, once the doctor had figured out what the issue really was, he went to get my parents. I went to into an emergency and all of that started. But it was another one of the factors that made me feel as if I was not worthy. Okay. So, um, as you moved into your 20s, one of the things that became apparent was chronic depression. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, you've often explained to me that you actually felt lucky compared to other people with chronic depression. Why was that? I was able to find an excellent psychiatrist that did take until 1985, until I was 30. And it was at uh, Regina Mental Health uh, Center. There was Dr. Severian Perez. And it took a full year just to get to the place where we could start therapy properly. Since that time, I have had some excellent psychiatric help. Um, in 2000, uh, after a serious, serious depression, I was off work for three years. Uh, finally, there was the combination of the right psychiatrist in Winnipeg, the right medical or the right medicine. It involved uh, a deep consultation with uh, uh, fellow, well, with a fellow, with a fellow whose name was Dr. Enns, no relation, but was a specialist in pharmacology and dealing with depression. And he prescribed uh, four different treatments. And it was the third one that worked. After the fourth one, we were talking about ECT, and I'm very glad the third one worked. That was from 2000, since that time. I've published books in 2005, 2012, 2014, and 2019. So on that end, I've done I've So done it's led you really to well. be, in your writing output, to be really productive. So the other invisible illness that you've talked about that you have that is a disability is osteoarthritis. That's and, correct. And chronic yeah. pain, and you've mentioned, and we'll get back to that in a little while, that it led to, to an amputation. Um, so now that you have this visible disability, as opposed to having lived all your lives with your both physical and mental disabilities being invisible, does it make a difference? It does, uh, particularly to people who don't know me. Um, the the uh, complication is with uh, the people that have known me for a long time as a successful arts administrator. And uh, don't imagine I could have done those things with the level of disability that I was coping with. So that's the same issue of credibility. That's a tough one, okay? Yeah, not yeah. Made, it's a tough one. Luca, you want to ask Mick any questions while you've got the moment before we then move on to the last piece of this? I'm just mesmerized by both of you and so happy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're so beautiful together and I can feel your energy and I can feel your love yeah. for each other. Well, it's, it's wonderful to live with a writer because it means, you know, as you know, I, I like to, I have my own work that I'm writing and that, you know, a little piece of education. And um, so he, you know, when I need to work in the morning, Victor writes, and in the afternoon, as you know, I sleep all afternoon every day. He goes off and writes a little more, and then in, e in the evening we have dinner, and that's it. We're done for the day. So it's a, uh, it, it works very well. Yeah, the uh, definition. I mean, Freud got just about everything wrong, but one of the things he did get right was that a uh, sign of mental health was the ability to love and work. And <laughs> I've got both right now. Oh, you're getting me emotional now. Luke will not be expecting that. So, you know. You're getting so, 
to finish, we're going to watch another video. So as we heard with, with Tara, the pandemic came and it altered the way people had to work. So yes. as a poet who was used to sharing his you know, work with the public, yeah. what did you decide to do? I uh, started looking at uh, working with visual artists and uh, graphic artists. And I had uh, become acquainted with Murray Case through my work through another magazine that I had uh, been involved in. And he had been our illustrator and I knew his work as an, <clears throat> excuse me, okay. and I knew his work as an animator, as well as a filmmaker. Uh, and he was able to provide uh, visual context for my work that made it much more accessible to somebody who was looking at it. It's sometimes quite difficult, I find, to pay attention to a talking head. There's so many of them, especially. The competition though was fierce because with COVID, just about everybody all of a sudden was online. So trying to get enough elbow space to, uh, to get some airtime like this is, uh, is, so you is start, quite difficult. So you started something together with Murray where you put together from the abject alphabet, which you can find on uh, Victor's YouTube channel. He's up to about to do letter F very shortly, which is a 15 minute um, combination of different pieces with different video behind them. When we got to letter E, one of the poems is a poem called Look. What's Look about? Very Well, it brings together my uh, experience of my mother's experience and then finally my feeling about my own disability. One of the things that did happen once I lost my leg is I found a sense of humor I don't think I was known for before. And, uh, and uh, that was something I hadn't expected. Um, and uh, I think as disabled people, we often have a pretty good sense of humor because that's, you know. Well, it won't be immediately off as. <laughs> it won't be off as in And now we're going to show oh, them well, a lot. Like, yeah, look, okay. isn't exactly a lot of fun. Last but, a minute. But, no. but, but anyway, it's a good piece of work. I'm very proud of it. So perhaps, Tom, um, if you could show everybody look and then uh, we'll wrap up. From Dead Mennonites by Victor Enns. Look. I look and I look. My leg doesn't grow back. Yes, I tell people I'm hard on things. People too, or so it seems, and especially hard on myself. You must have seen that coming. I work in threes. I remember three-legged races at our school's field day. Dixie cup ice cream for winners and losers. I came in third. Red licorice isn't licorice at all. My mother explained this to me while offering black licorice, her favorite indulgence along with the dried apricots in her night table. My leg below the left knee is gone. I look and I look and cannot remember what having the leg was like. No memory of it, no phantom pain. Lousy cartilage genetics, said the surgeon. Sorry. My shoulders are bone on bone. I say I am bone-tired with elan and forgetfulness. My parents are dead. They died never needing to know I've lost a leg below the knee. My mother would take it in stride. Doctors were for very near-death experiences. For saving my brother's leg so he could continue being a farmhand with his brothers. Surgery was rough on the oak table her dead husband made. Grandma begged, blood dripping on the kitchen linoleum. The leg stayed on, my Uncle John's leg, so he could get on a tractor and marry a good woman of New Bergthal. The line of blood traveling through his seven children secured. Homestead, too. He smoked himself into an early grave. I carried him with my cousins, me concentrating on my lift, my feet on the church steps. I don't need my leg to get on a tractor. Don't need a leg for anything. I'm ready. Go ahead. Take the other leg, too. Wow. <laughs>
that was an experience that was <laughs> and yes. powerful that finale um at first i felt like i was having a bad trip and then i was like <laughs> <laughs> we should introduce you to murray yeah yeah no I, the i've been very lucky he's working on f and i have no idea what he's going to do uh, well i do have some idea it's going to be good it's going to be good murray's been great to work with um, he has uh as we call it these days, lived experience with mental illness in his family as well. So uh, it's another way that we can connect and work together. Awesome. Victor, Michelle, I just want to say thank you. Michelle, thank you for giving me this break and allowing me to be a participant and not, <laughs> I just want to say, I appreciate it. Victor, it's really nice to meet you. Michelle, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be able to work alongside you. Um, we're going to have to quickly wrap up just because we are over time at this moment. So I do want to say a big thank you to Tara Yanis for joining us earlier on. Thank you again, Michelle and Victor. You are amazing. And to all of our participants, thank you so much for being a part of Roundup. To our tech team, to our interpreters, everyone behind the scenes who are working really hard to make sure that these events work on a successful, as successful as they are. So thank you very much. Um, next month, October 14th, we have a special dedication to a Montreal dancer named France Jeffroy, who uh, recently passed away. And her dance company, members of her dance company, will be joining us. And I will also be dancing and doing a dance performance. So we invite all of you to join us on October 14th. But before that, we have an election going on. So please make sure to go out and vote. Uh, make sure that our voices as Canadians with disabilities, our voices will be heard. Um, no matter what party you are voting for, just make sure that you have that opportunity to get your vote out. Um, also, uh, Stephanie, if you can put the Othello link one more time in the chat box, we have a link for a survey to try to make sure that we can get an the, the, the most important asks for uh, this Canada Disability Benefit, making sure that Canadians with disabilities are involved with this process. Please visit this link, fill out the survey, pass it along to your friends, do whatever you can, and let's make sure that Canadians with disabilities have a voice uh, in this year's election. Let's make sure that we can make change as a community, come together, come united, come as one, as all, and let's make uh, Canada a stepping stone for the rest of the world. So I just want to say thank you all once again. We'll see you on October 14th and have a great rest of the week. Peace, everyone. <laughs>